Well, let's just open it up to you for questions real quick here, and, and I want to I wanna ask you a question. If you were to use one word to talk about how you might grow in your Christian life, or that you might grow in an area of life, um, what word would you use? Just any word. Just what do you think? If, if you wanted to grow in your Christian life, one word that you might use, what would it be? What? Drinks. What kind of drinks, Lee? (laughs) Okay. I'm not sure that's going to help you grow, but. (laughs) Oh, okay. Okay. So what, what would you say for improvement? What would you drink for improvement? Okay. Half juice, half water. Okay. One word you would use to, uh, to describe how you might grow. One word. What? Discipline. Ooh, okay. Discipline. Understanding. These are great. Surrender. Okay. Consistency. Consistency. Okay. Endurance. Okay. Endurance, consistency, discipline. Okay, adversity. Yeah, adversity can make you grow or push you away, but adversity certainly can do that. What's that? Okay, accountability can help you grow. Being accountable for your life and living your life in an accountable relationship. Um, oh, Carol. Okay, participation. So we don't grow alone. We have to participate with other people. Excellent. When I think of a word, I, I, I think all these words are fantastic, and they are true. Discipline can help you. Endurance can help you. Perseverance can help you. All these words are great words, and I would add to these really good words the word cooperation. Cooperation. You have to cooperate. Um, one of the things I tell the students at Multnomah when I'm teaching there, and especially in this area of spiritual life or whatever, I say, you've got to learn to cooperate with God. It's just an issue of cooperation. I mean, God has given us his Holy Spirit to live inside of us. God has brought Christ to die for us and to to, to remove from us those things which disrupt our lives and keep us from him. And the Trinity is always working in us. But there has to be a cooperation between ourselves and God. The word cooperate. In other words, when, when you look at the Christian life, it's a life of cooperation. It's a life of cooperation. And that's true, you know, when you're going through a difficult time. As you know, our series here is called Peterbilt, Pressing On When the Pressure's On. And in the midst of pressure, and in the midst of times when life gets a little difficult, the best thing is to cooperate with God, is to keep on moving forward by cooperating with Him and continuing on in those things that you know are going to enable you to grow. So if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter, because we're in this series in 1 Peter, and... In 1 Peter here, as you know, Peter's writing to a group of people who are scattered throughout, as it says in the early verses there, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. This is written around mm, 60, 65, somewhere in there. Um, The uh, persecutions of Nero are really literally um, warming up. He's uh, setting the city on fire. He's covering Christians with tar. He's lighting them up, and uh, the church is in a real mess, and they are, 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 are scattered. And some of them have left, and they're being persecuted within Jerusalem. Others of them are waiting, and Peter is writing to those here who are scattered throughout Pontus, but there's also those in Pontus who are eventually going to find themselves in persecution. They're going to find themselves under incredible pressure. And last week, you remember, we said that Peter reminds them kind of about the life that they have. And remember, he says, listen, listen, you have everything to live for and nothing to lose. And he, and he puts forth this identity issue. Look, here's the life that you have to live. You have everything to live for and nothing to lose when it comes to God because it's a living hope. It's a living hope. It's based on the resurrection. And he reminds them again of this incredible work of Jesus through the resurrection. But some of them might be saying, well, as I try to live this life, how do I do that? How do I go about living this life? How do I go about cooperating with God in order to live this life that I can live and have nothing to lose? How do I go about doing that? 
I have a friend who reads books, and when they read, um, when the book gets a little more theoretical, or it says something in the book, but doesn't give them any sort of guidance, he writes in the margin, YBH, yes, but how? <laughs> yes, I believe that, but how do I go about living that? I mean, how do I do that? Um, how do I end up, you know, we say love one another. Okay, how do I go about doing that? We say God's given us this life that we can live and we have nothing to lose. Okay, how do we go about doing that? Peter understands that. He understands that that's a question people have here because they're scattered all over. All right, how do I live this life, Peter, even though I'm kicked out of my house, my family might have disowned me, I'm going under incredible pressure. I know you say I have this life, but how do I really live it? Well, he answers that question. He answers that question in verses 13 here through uh, chapter 1, 13 through 2, 3. So let's look at what Peter says about how we can cooperate with God. How do we live in light of this future coming hope that we have, that Jesus will return? How do we live in light of that? So again, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to kind of dig in right in there. The first thing he says here for us in cooperating with God is don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Does that sound familiar to you? Does that sound familiar? Fleetwood Mac song. Fleetwood Mac was formed in 1967. And uh, it was actually when they thought about naming their band, they took the name of one of the band members, Mac, and another one named Fleetwood, and they mixed them together. <laughs> Called it Fleetwood Mac. So it wasn't very creative, but that how, that's how the group got its name, actually. And they came up with this song, Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow. He says there, if you wake up and don't want to smile, if it takes just a little while, open your eyes and look at the day. You'll see things in a different way. Don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Don't stop. It'll soon be here. It'll be better than before. Yesterday's gone. Yesterday's gone. Well, notice what Peter says in verse 13. He says, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus is revealed. The day. The day. Put your mind on the day. You can't change tomorrow, but put your mind on the day that Jesus is going to ultimately come back. Put your mind on that day. And he says, look, if you're going to think about tomorrow, here's some ways to do it. And he begins by talking about girding your minds for action, being self-controlled, and setting ultimately your hope on Jesus Christ. Mind, setting your mind, thinking about tomorrow, thinking about how you're going to live in light of the fact that Jesus is going to turn. Setting your mind. The word here for preparing your minds means literally to roll up your sleeves. Roll up your sleeves and get to work. Get your mind working about what it's going to be like and use that as a model for what you're going to do today. What you're going to do today. And notice he says, set your hope on that action as well. Set your hope on that too. You see, when, when we are under pressure, our minds get scattered. And when the pressure is on and life takes these twists and turns, things we don't expect, sometimes our minds just get turned around upside down. And Peter says, no, keep your mind focused. And that's tough to do. I was talking to a friend who was a counselor, and he said, you know, we live in this age of what he calls continuous partial attention. Continuous partial attention. What he means by that is through our cell phones, through our iPads, through our emails, through the websites, through all the information that's coming, we never focus on anything. And there's this sense of this continuous partial attention. We, we don't think, we don't have thought. And Peter is saying here, look, you've got to gird your mind. You've got to be a thoughtful person and think through what's happening. Keep thinking about tomorrow. Think about when Jesus comes and let that be something that prepares you. Notice he talks about self-control. He says, in light of that day that's coming, be self-controlled. Doesn't say you can't enjoy things. Exercise self-control. Exercise self-control. He doesn't say you can't enjoy the pleasures of life. He just says, exercise some self-control. And then set your hope on the things of Jesus coming. So he says, prepare your mind. Proverbs 23, 7. As a man thinks within himself, so is he. Romans 12, 1. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Philippians 4, 8. Think on these things. Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is right. Think on these things. 
there's this constant plea in the Bible for us to live today in light of tomorrow with minds that are girded up. Minds that are girded up. Now look what else he says. Let's go look at that. He says here, as obedient children, somebody used the word discipline, obedient, do not conform to the evil desires when you lived in your ignorance. But just as he called you is holy, be holy in all you do, for it's written, be holy for I am holy. Our thinking ought to ultimately lead to behavioral changes. And what he's saying there is, look, just be different. The root word of holiness is different. It just means to be different. Like the temple in the Old Testament was a holy place because it was different. The Sabbath was a holy day in the Old Testament because it was a different day. Jesus was holy because he not only had the internal holiness, but he was different, different in the way he treated people. And what Peter's saying here is just be different. Be different. Be a different kind of people. Be a different kind of people. Be holy. Be holy. So the first thing, first thing of uh, cooperating is just say, hey, I got to cooperate in my mind. I got to I got to think about it and, and let that mindset move me into certain behaviors. Let's look at something else. Um, one of the things I always appreciate when I watch sports on TV or I watch something where they're describing someone is when they say to somebody or about somebody, they've never forgot where they've come from. They've never forgot where they've come from. That's a kind of statement of humility. It's a statement that says they're, they're the same. They're, they're people who know where they've come from. They're people who understand their roots. They're people who understand that life has given them certain blessings and uh, they've never forgotten where they've come from and they live today with the knowledge that they're privileged, that they're blessed, and they're so very, very grateful. Look what Peter says here in the next series of verses. Since you call on your father who judges each man's work impartially, live as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty, notice, way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish and defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but revealed to you in these last times. Though you know, uh, though he, through him you know or believe in God, who was raised from the dead and glorified him, so your faith and hope are in God. Okay, it's a mouthful. But need never forget how you got where you are. That's another thing. Look, where you are right now as a follower of Jesus or where you are um, as a person who um, is trying to follow Jesus, don't forget how you got there. Notice what he's saying. He says, first of all, remember that there's going to come a day when you're going to be held accountable for your life. Somebody used the word accountability. I think it was Amy. There's going to come a day when you're going to be held accountable. For the believer, that's a job evaluation. It's an issue of your productivity. It's not an issue of your destiny. So for someone who knows Jesus, if you know Jesus, it's going to essentially be a time when he asks you, hey, what did you do with these gifts I've given you? What did you do with the life I gave you? Um, you know, I died for you. What did you do with it? It's going to be an issue of your productivity, not your destiny. Your destiny is sure because nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. But your productivity, on the other hand, and when I say that, I mean the effort you've made to live the Christian life, that's what's going to ultimately be evaluated. Notice his words here when he says, you serve this father who is a judge. He's going to ultimately impartially judge each and every one of us. He's going to hold us accountable. And he says here, never forget where you are, because look what he says. You got here in your life because of what Jesus has done for you solely and completely. That's it. You got here. Even though you might have cooperated, you got here because Jesus died for you. Notice this. It wasn't through silver or gold, a way of life handed down from your forefathers. Now, look, here it is. What he's saying there is, you know, some of you grew up in a religious background, and maybe that religious background caused you to do all kinds of works. For these people in Peter's day, some of them were Gentiles and they made sacrifices of silver and gold to idols, to, um, to demons, to a lot of different people and a lot of different spiritual entities. And he says, you know, it wasn't by that. It isn't by any religious practice that your heart ultimately changes. It isn't by anything like that that gets you to God. It isn't like that that makes you a follower of Jesus. Notice it was through the blood of Christ 
a lamb without blemish or defect. You remember what John the Baptist said in John chapter 1? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's it. Once you believed in Jesus, he did this work in you, and he took away everything that disrupted your life or was disrupting your life, and he said, look, I'm getting rid of that sin issue, and it only came because he came into your life, because he looked and he, he responded, and, and you responded to his invitation, I should say, and that's what happened. But he was working on inside of you all the, all the while. And it only came because of that. And it came because he was chosen before the creation of the world. So think about it. It always was about Jesus. It always was about what he was going to do. It always was. Always. Even before anything was created, it was always about Jesus and his sacrifice. In fact, you read the Old Testament, all those sacrifices, all that temple worship, all the, uh, all the days of feasting, all the days, Passover, uh, the day of Jubilee, all of those, everything was pointing to what? Jesus. Everything was pointing to Jesus. It was all about Jesus. It was all about the fact that he was coming. Because it says right here, before he was chosen before the creation of the world. He was ultimately going to pay the price for the sins of all humanity. And once a person believes on that, it becomes theirs. And that was God's plan from the very, very beginning. It wasn't like, oh my goodness, that didn't work. Now we got to do this. No, God knew exactly what was going to happen and exactly the, what was going to occur and how humanity was going to fall. And never forget it. Never forget where you've come from. Never forget that and how you got where you are. He says, look, in the middle of all that pressure, Remember the grace of God that's been at work in you so you don't deny it. It's easy to just fall away, but remember how you got where you are and all the blessings that have been given to you. You know, um, we study the word of God for a lot of things. Many of you have studied God's word and um, the word of God helps us know God. The word of God helps us understand God. But sometimes um, we forget that the word of God ought to be doing something else in our lives. And Peter reminds them of that, that they were born again by the word of God, but the word was supposed to do something inside them. And here's the third thing. Love like you mean it. Love like you mean it. Look at verse 22. Now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth, you've been obeying and following Jesus, he says, so that you have a sincere love for the brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again. Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass and all the, their glory is like flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our Lord stands forever. He's quoting Isaiah 40 verses 6 through 8. And this is the word that was preached to you. Now I, wanna, I want you to see the connection here. Notice he says, love your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. The message translation translates that verse this way love one, love one another as if your lives depended on it and you know what love is that way love is that way love is the most important thing in many ways i mean we love god we love each other we love the world to know your love that's a vital thing people who don't know their love it's so hard and that's why the church should be the most loving place on earth that's why the church ought to be a place where the love of God saturates and permeates everything we do here at Gateway. And every church ought to be a place that's the most loving place on the earth. But notice how he connects these two. He connects the eternal word with the word that never uh, dies. Love that never dies. For you were born again. Notice. You were born again. If you're born again and God's word is in your heart, guess what you're going to do? Love. That's what you're going to do. You're not going to be a Pharisee. You're not going to become a, 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 a snooty Bible scholar. That's not what you're going to become. Um, no. I mean, you're going to love. Now, nothing wrong with Bible scholars. Nothing wrong with scholarship. Nothing wrong with academics. Nothing wrong with all of that. But the key thing that he wants to put out here for us is love. Loving one another deeply from the heart. For you've been born again, not a perishable seed. See that? Word doesn't perish, and love doesn't perish. Love just keeps going on and on and on. Remember last week what I said about love? 
that little sign I saw in the church sign, love everybody, I'll sort things out later, God. Remember? That's so true. You know, love everybody, I'll sort things out later. That is really true when it comes to God. God will sort everything out, but the goal of the church is to love. And that's what the word should do. It should make us more loving. It should make us more loving as a group of people. You know, now that the sun's coming out and uh, things are looking good, I've already noticed around our neighborhood, maybe you have too, I've seen all these signs pop up. Estate sale, garage sale. Have you seen them already? People are already cleaning things out, you know. The good weather sort of brings about a certain kind of spring cleaning, a spring cleaning. You know, and maybe that's where you're at. You know, maybe your garage is so full that you can't get your cars in there, you know. Maybe it's time for a little bit of spring cleaning. Maybe your closet's so full that there's no room to hang anything else in there. And so you've got little piles of clothes all over your room. Maybe it's time for some spring cleaning. We all have it. Um, my man cave, oh, I don't even want to talk about it, you know. Um, it's got papers all piled up and, you know, stuff like that. And, uh, you know, Kathy's been so patient with me on that. I just tell her, don't move anything, you know. Don't move anything because I might not be able to find things. Well, guess what? One of the ways that we cooperate with God as we look to the future, one of the ways we do that is we clean our own internal house. Look at this word. Let's look at chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, rid yourself of malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. Now, you remember we always say this. When you see the word therefore, you ask what? What's it there for? Right? If you see the word therefore, you always ask, what's it there for? Notice how he attaches it. He attaches it to the word and he attaches it to love. So what is he using here? What is he saying? Remove anything from your life that disrupts love. That disrupts love. Look, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Those things disrupt love. They disrupt us loving each other. I mean, if we, are, um, if we are the kind of people who have anger toward others or we deceive others or we put on a mask in front of others or we envy other people's positions or we have slander of every kind, you know what that word slander really means? If we defame people's character, it has to do with defamation of character. If we look at somebody and we defame their character, those are unloving things. And Peter says, get rid of them because they block your ability to love. They block your ability to love. Get rid of them. James uses the same kind of thing in James 1 21. He says, get rid of these things in your life. In Hebrews chapter 2, take off anything that hinders you running. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, take it all off. So he's saying here, look, clean your house up. Get rid of all these things. Move away from these things that keep your spirit from living in the future. They keep your spirit from loving people. Clean your own house. Clean your house. Now, let's kind of wrap this up. He's got one more thing to say here. He's not only talking about, you know, cleaning our own house and uh, making sure that, um, you know, we realize where we've come from, but he's got one more thing, and I want to kind of lead that in with a question for you. Um, have you ever talked to people about what their favorite food is? Have you ever asked somebody what their favorite food is? Have you ever? Johnny, you've done that? How do people respond when they tell you about their favorite food? They tell you it, okay? All right? They tell you it. No, that makes sense. But how do they tell you? Passion, right? Yeah, passion. I mean, when people start talking about their favorite food, it's, it's passionate. I mean, you talk to somebody and say, hey, what's your favorite food? And they go, oh, you know, I, this, oh, they, I mean, they just like, lean back and go, ah, oh, you got to taste this, you know, or, oh, this is the best. If you've ever been there, this place has the best. Or you ask somebody, what's your favorite restaurant? They go, oh, you got to go there. You just got to go there. This place is unbelievable. I mean, and they start to kind of crave this food, you know, they start craving it. They start wanting it. And uh, they go, because I've tasted it. It is so incredibly good. You will taste it too. And, and uh, I'll s talk to somebody and they'll say, yeah, I just crave this stuff crave it. Well, look what Peter says. Crave what's good for you. Crave what's good for you. Notice verse 2 and 3. 
like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. So what he says is don't forget when you first became a believer and what it was like to taste Jesus and what he did in your life. Don't forget that and crave that. In the midst of times when life gets really pressure-packed, crave the things of Jesus. Remember what it was like to know Jesus when you first became a believer. And sometimes this, like newborn babes, craving spiritual milk, this is used in some ways as a derogatory uh, phrase in some passages. Here, it's positive. In other passages, it's, well, you should get off of the milk and get onto the real meat. But here, Peter is saying, like a baby craves milk. And those of you that have had children know that, that a baby just craves milk. Jeff, you're shaking your head, right? Why do you shake your head? Yeah. <laughs> yep, that's right. And he craves it, doesn't he? Yeah, he craves it. I mean, he craves it. And, you know, Jeff's, Jeff's being worn out, by the way, so you've got to pray for Jeff. He's, he, uh, he didn't expect this, but uh, he's being worn out. Oh, you're done. Okay, you're done. But he saw it firstly. That's exactly right. A baby craves milk. And it's saying here, crave the things of God. Remember where you've come from. Remember how thirsty you got. I mean, I can go back and I remember the night that I became a follower of Jesus at 17. I woke up the next day and I couldn't get enough of, of thinking about God. And I remember I went in the next day, just 24 hours later, and I asked my dad, do we have a Bible anywhere? I mean, I've never opened a Bible. I mean, I could care less about it. But all of a sudden, I, I was like, where's the Bible? And my dad went in and, he, you know, honestly, he pulled it off the shelf and went, <laughs> blew off the dust. Because, um, you know, we were in a religious tradition where people didn't bring their Bibles and we didn't need it. And I remember just holding it. And I remember reading it. And I remember underlining it, underlining it. And I read through the New Testament in two days. I mean, I just couldn't get enough of it. I couldn't get enough of it. I just craved it. I craved it. I craved it. Because I had tasted God through his Holy Spirit, and I just craved the Bible. And then I craved fellowship. And I wanted to be around other Christians. And then I craved serving the Lord. And I thought, oh, this is great. I mean, I was so grateful, so thankful, so thirsty to just want to serve the Lord and appreciate him. I was just craving opportunities to grow, just craving them. I mean, I, I, I started going to Sunday school. I'd never been to Sunday school in my life. And here I am. I'm a football player at Oak Park High School, a senior, and I walk into Sunday school class, didn't know anything, didn't know anything. But I wanted to be there. And then I started going all the time. And then I started going to church all the time. I was there when every, I mean, whenever I could be. And I became a bus driver, and I cleaned the toilets, and I painted the missionary house. I mean, I did everything. I just craved the spiritual things of God. I craved to want to know the Lord. I would go on Wednesdays. I'd go on Sundays. I'd go on Sunday nights. I just crave that. I crave that. And uh, sometimes I look back and go, wow, Lord, that was an incredible time. I mean, I had tasted you through my salvation and found you to be so good. And I hope I never lose that craving for those things that really helped me grow. Craving those things that really, really helped me grow. Notice what he says. Now that you've tasted, the Lord is good. Crave those good things again. Crave those things that just bring you joy when it comes to knowing Jesus and living for him. You know, we've talked about cooperating. We've talked about living for Jesus. And, and we've talked about what it means to be a Christian. I want to read a letter to you. Um, biblical literists and um, archaeologists found a letter, and uh, they've tried to date this letter, and it possibly is a letter that goes back to the second century. It's a letter from a man named Diognetus. And somebody had asked him, what is it about these Christians? What is it? Now, again, this is second century stuff. So we're talking about 100 to 200 AD. Somewhere in there is where this letter is dated, and they have translated it. And when someone asked this individual, Diognetus, um, what about these Christians? Listen to, the, listen to what he wrote. Sounds a lot like Peter. 
For Christians are not differentiated from other people by country, language, or custom. You see, they, did not, they do not live in cities of their own or speak some strange dialect or have some peculiar lifestyle. In other words, Christians are like everyone else. This teaching of theirs has not been contrived by the invention or speculation of inquisitive men. It wasn't made up. Nor are they propagating mere human teaching as some people do. They live in both Greek and foreign cities wherever chance puts them. They follow local customs in clothing, food, and other aspects all of all of life. But at the same time, these Christians demonstrate to us wonderful and certainly unusual form of their own citizenship. They live in their own native lands, but as aliens. As citizens, they share all things with others, but like aliens, they suffer all things. Every foreign country is to them a native country. Every native country to them is a foreign country. They marry and have children, just like everyone else. But they do not kill their unwanted babies. They offer a shared table, but not a shared bed. They are at present in the flesh, but they don't live according to the flesh. They are passing their days on earth, but they're citizens of heaven. They obey the appointed laws around the community, and yet go beyond those laws in their own lives. They love everyone, but are persecuted by all. They're unknown and condemned, but they're put to death and they gain life. They're poor, yet they make other people very rich. They are short of everything, yet they always have plenty of all things. They are dishonored and disowned, and yet they gain glory through their dishonor. Their names are blackened, and yet they are cleared. They are mocked, and they bless people in return. They're treated outrageously and behave respectfully when they're mistreated. When they do good, they are punished as evildoers. When they are punished, they rejoice as being given new life in Jesus. They are attacked by the Jews as aliens and are persecuted by the Greeks. Listen to this. Yet those who hate them cannot figure out why. To put it simply, the soul is to the body as Christians are to the world. The soul is spread through all parts of the body and Christians are spread through all the cities of the world. The soul is, is in the body, but is not of the body. Christians are in the world, but they're not of the world. Isn't that great? I mean, this writer, and I don't know if he knows Jesus or not, is just essentially saying, you know, Christians live differently. They cooperate with something that is beyond them. And um, they are people who are extraordinary people because they have that sense of the future, but they live that future today. They live it today. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for helping us live the life that you want us to live. When we've asked questions like, yes, but how, you've just shown us how. Lord, help us. Um, help us to not forget about the future that's coming in the midst of those pressure-packed moments, that life will be different. Help us as well um, to be people who love. Heaven is a place of love. And the new kingdom and new heaven and new earth will be a place of love. And so help us to love each other deeply. And then, Lord, help us not to forget where we came from. Let us just take this, this beautiful gift you've given us and let us remember that so that we can live with humility and grace to those around us. And, Lord, I would pray that you would also help us crave the things that will help us grow and then to clean out what's ever in us to keep us from being the most loving people on the planet. Lord, Holy Spirit, work in our lives so that we might display and demonstrate these things to the world, so that we might truly be different people. People who reflect you. People who love in deep and rich ways. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.